you and Magnus played a private game, 40 games of Blitz in 2010 in Moscow at a hotel. This sounds and just feels legendary. Final score was 24 and a half to 15 and a half for Magnus. Where did you find out the score? I'm actually curious. I don't think it was publicly said or it was very briefly said, but it wasn't ever like mentioned in a, in a serious way. So I think it's a deep dive based on a few links that started as an, at a subreddit, which is how all great journeys start. Right. Yeah, so this is kind of a crazy story. There, This was not pre-planned at all. I remember this quite well. Um, I went out to dinner that final night with someone who was actually very high up within the internet chess club at that time. I went out for a nice dinner. I think I had like a couple of drinks. Maybe it was wine, beer. I don't know what it was. And I think towards the end of the dinner, somehow they got word of this and they, they relayed the information to me that Magus wanted to play a private match. Now, I agreed to play this match. Probably I should not have. And actually, it has nothing to do with like the state of having been out, had a few drinks, anything of that nature. But the reason that I probably should not have agreed to play this match and why I very oftentimes reference it as one of the biggest mistakes in terms of competitive chess that I made is specifically because it gave Magnus a chance to understand my style of chess. And at the time, I actually had pretty good results against Magnus. I think maybe he was up one or two games, but there were many games where I had been pressing close to winning against him prior to that match. And so when I went and played that match, there were a few things that happened. First of all, Magnus really started to understand my style because we played all sorts of different openings. Um, and so I think he understood that at times I wasn't so great in the opening, and there were many openings where I would play slightly dubious variations as opposed to the main lines. Um, and then secondly... From my standpoint, the problem that I realized is since we were playing with an increment, there were many games where I was close to winning, and he would defend end games amazingly well. He would defend what are technical, technically drawn end games, but where I would have like an extra pawn, it would be like rook and bishop versus rook and knight. Say I have four pawns, he has three pawns, end games of this nature. Now, if you aren't super into chess, you might not understand uh, what I'm referring to. If you are, you will. But there are end games where one side might have extra material, an extra pawn, say extra two pawns, but theoretically it's a draw. So it's Can you give an play. example of the set of pieces? We're talking about five, six, seven pieces, like so, this kind of thing? Uh, okay, like a very basic one would be rook and four pawns against rook and three pawns. So that would be nine total pieces on the board, four pawns on one side, three pawns um, on the other side, um, but it's all on the same side of the board. Now, this is a technical draw. It's been known for probably, let's just say, 70 years, roughly, give or take, that this is a theoretical draw. No matter the play. position of the pawns, it's... Just all the pawns are on one side of the board. So, like... But, like, I, where you know, they are... So, it's like, let's just say they're, let's just say they're four pawns right here. Mm -hmm. They're just four pawns. And black has three pawns. So, your pawns are on h6, g6, and f6. And there are no other pawns on the board. Something like this. And you both have rooks. And it's a draw. No matter what the next next like 50 moves of the game are, we know that it's a draw and end game um, with perfect play. And so it was things like this where Magnus actually saved, I want to say like five or six of these. And I remember it quite well because I think the score was very, very close up until probably the last like 10 games of the match. And then at the end, he started winning. He started winning in, in spades. But there were a lot of situations where he was up like one game or maybe two games in the match. And I had some end game like this and I was not able to win the end game. And so for me, after that match, it wasn't even so much that I lost the match or the margin I lost by, but it was the fact that I realized how hard it was to beat him even once you got the advantage. And I think for Magnus, he learned that my weakness was openings. I remember because I actually, I don't remember the game itself, but there was a game we played in the Sicilian Nidor. Mm -hmm. um, and he played this variation with Bishop G5 on move number six. I'm sure you can you can insert a graphic later. I can show you. And Sicilian I think- is a type of opening. Mm -hmm. Sicilian's the opening, Nidorf is the variation. It was played by Bobby Fischer, the former world champion, Gary Kasparov as well. And so we, we played all sorts of different openings because, of course, it's not a serious, it's, it's a serious match, but it's not serious where it's going to count for the ranking. So you're trying to fill out where your opponent is strong versus weak. And so there was one game, I remember this very clearly, he played the Bishop G5 variation in the Nidorf. And I think I played E5 or I played Knight BD7 in E5, which is dubious. It's not the best response. And that's just one example of where I was playing things that were a little bit dubious, and I was not playing the absolute main line with 20 moves of theory. So I was trying to get outside of theory. And I think Magnus learned from that that even though it appeared that I was very well prepared in, in these openings, I wasn't quite at that level. Couldn't you have a different interpretation of you going outside of the main line that you're willing to experiment, take risks, that you're chaotic, and that's actually a strength, not a weakness? Especially when you're sitting in a hot hotel room at late at night, this is past midnight, mm -hmm. um, 
playing chess. I mean, why do you interpret that that's your weakness? Because Magnus going forward was able to figure out the, the lines where you have to be super precise. You cannot deviate at all. And I got punished out of the opening in many games. So it was like, it wasn't about the Night Orf, the, the opening or the variation specifically, but he knew what my repertoire was and he would pick lines where I had to play the absolute best lines in order to equalize um, or I would be much worse. And he was very effective at doing that. But nevertheless, it's pretty legendary that the two of you, you're one of the best chess players in the world throughout the whole period still today that you just sat down in a hotel room and played a ton of chess. Like what, what was that like? I mean, what's the, there's a, I think there's a, there, there is a little here, there is a little video of it. Sure. I mean, this is like epic, right? How did this video exist, by the way? I think there was one journalist, uh, Macaulay Peterson, who was, who was able to um, film parts of it. So it was, it was in a room. It was me, Magnus. I think Henrik was there. I think Macaulay was there, and that was it. People can go on YouTube and watch. It's on Chess Digital Strategies, Macaulay Peterson channel. For people just listening to this, there's a, a dimly lit room with a yellow light emerging out of the darkness of the two faces of Magnus <laughs> I mean, and the deep focus here. And what time is this? This is must be. This like... is probably at like one in the morning. This yeah. was, uh, I believe, the day of day after the final. This was the day that the final round occurred and the closing ceremonies. We were playing afterwards. I mean, are you able to appreciate the epicness of this? Many of my favorite memories are actually similar to this. Another memory that I really have that I recall very fondly was after the U.S. Championship. It was called the 2005 U.S. Chess Championship. It was held um, at the end of 2004 in, I believe it was in La Jolla in San Diego. I won that event. And after that, that event, I was playing Blitz probably for like four or five hours in the lobby of the hotel. So it's the same kind of situation where you're just playing for the love of the game as opposed to anything else. Of course, nowadays, um, I think both for Magnus and myself, just playing a dim dimly lit room like this would almost certainly not happen. There would probably have to be um, certain stakes involved for, for us to play. But, you know, if you go back in time, these are the sorts of uh, memories and moments that would happen all the time. So is there a part of you that doesn't regret that this happened? You know, I think it comes back to my general philosophy. I feel like everything happens for a reason. And so because I have that, that's one of my core beliefs. Like, I don't really look back on it as mistakes. I feel like everything has happened and things have transpired the way they have for a reason. If I look at it in terms of potentially like world championship aspirations, I think certainly it was a big mistake. Because from a competitive standpoint, Magnus figured out what my weaknesses were at the time, and he exploited it for many, many years. 